Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight we learn about the relationship between glacial melts and the Earth's climate history. These historical melting patterns and the information from their deposits are very important resources for modern climate science. Our distinguished guest is Jack Ridge, Professor of Geology and Chair of the Department of Earth and Ocean Sciences at Tufts University. Dr. Ridge has received prestigious awards and is a fellow of the Geological Society of America. Tonight, he shares with us his expertise on glacial geology, especially what glacial sediments called VARVs reveal about climate change over centuries and additional kinds of information such as when the ancient habitation was possible or not in some areas. I should mention that Dr. Ridge's VARV website is an excellent resource for students and teachers and the general public. It is a great pleasure to welcome Professor Jack Ridge. Welcome, Thank you. sir. Thank you. And I wonder if we could start by getting a little background about glaciers, the reason I ask is that there seems to be a lot of interest related to climate science. To sure. So uh, the picture I have up is a picture of the Susitna Glacier in Alaska. When we refer to a pile of ice and snow that is a glacier, it has to have a couple characteristics. One, it has to be the result of the accumulation of snow. And second, it has to show evidence of movement. So glaciers move by sliding across the land surface, but when you stack up snow and ice to a great thickness, as occurs in Greenland or Antarctica, mm -hmm. the ice at the bottom is under enough pressure to deform under its own weight. So uh, the glacier's moving across the land surface, and we see the results of that. Today we see scratches and grooves on the land surface, yeah. and we see all the deposits on the land surface that were brought here by the ice. Right. So uh, the picture is of the Susitna Glacier in Alaska. All glaciers have high elevation areas where snow falls on the ice sheet and it doesn't melt in the following summer. So it continuously stacks up to the point where the ice starts to move and it moves to places of lower elevation where last winter's snow entirely melts off and older ice melts off. So you're producing meltwater. Uh, a glacier that's in balance will have as much snow falling on it as uh, meltwater leaving it. Oh, I see. So, but the problem is right now we don't have that balance. We okay. have a situation where uh, glaciers are losing mass. They're delivering more meltwaters to the rivers and lakes that are in front of them and eventually it ends up in the ocean. Then uh, they're receiving as snowfall. Okay. So we have a situation where the glaciers are getting smaller right now okay. as a result of, you know, the warming of the climate. And that is one reason why there's a great interest in them now. Sure. That that's a kind of an acceleration okay. of okay. this. Okay. In terms of over the history of the Earth, yes. the relationship between glaciers and climate. Yes. Could you give us a little background about that too, please? Yes, yeah, so um, North America is a good place to talk about this. So for about the last two and a half million years, we've had periods of time that are dictated by cycles in the Earth's orbit where we have cooler conditions, we receive less sunlight. And as a result, snow and ice starts to accumulate at higher elevations. And the result is that we have the growth of ice caps. Starting about two and a half million years ago, North America mm -hmm, had, mm -hmm. had an ice cap grow on it. Um, those periods of time that we call glaciations are followed by warmer periods that we call interglacials. Okay. And so those are periods of time when we receive a little bit more sunlight and the ice sheets collapse and they melt and the water goes back into the ocean. Uh, when we have a glacial period, a lot of the water that's in the ocean is actually stored on the land surface, so we have a lower sea level. So that's been going on for about two and a half million years. And right now we happen to be in an interglacial period, a relatively warm period. If we were to go back 
25,000 years ago uh, and back to Boston, uh, yeah. we would be under a considerable amount of ice at that time, maybe a thousand meters. Wow, so. that did melt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how far through uh, uh, North America was did that glacier go, the North American glacier? So it, it, uh, it came out of Canada into yeah. New England and reached the southern coast of New England. So uh, Long Island, the part of New York State, uh, Block Island, uh, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are essentially piles of dirt put down at the margin of the glacier. So all of New all the rest of New England was completely under the ice. Yes. And the glacier spread out onto the continental shelf east of, of uh, New England. So, ah. so there was a, a considerable thickness of ice here. And that margin goes across right through New York City, in fact, right across Staten Island and New Jersey and Pennsylvania, back up into New York State and then back out of New York State across northwestern Pennsylvania and over into Ohio and Indiana. And it covered most of the northern Midwestern states okay. as well and covered the Great Lakes region. Yeah, and that you said sure. that yeah. gave us the Great Lakes. Yes, in it, the end, absolutely. As, sure. it, as it melted. Okay, so it was substantial. And why do they study these glaciers? What's in this? Well, geologists are essentially of two types. There, there's the types that study, um, they're called glaciologists. They're the people that study modern glaciers and try to figure out how modern glaciers operate. And a big thing we're concerned about now is how they accumulate snow and how they move. We want to know their velocity and we want to know how modern melting influences that. So there's a lot of work, for instance, being done in Greenland on that type of mm -hmm. thing. Um, we're also worried about the Antarctic ice sheet mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the volume of ice there is tremendous. Um, if we were to melt all the glaciers in the world, sea level would rise about 65 meters. Mm -hmm. If we were to go back to the last ice age and put all of the ice back on the land surface, sea level would be about 130 meters lower than where it is today. So the health of glaciers right now is, is something that basically controls sea level change. And uh, glaciers are our canary in the coal mine. Yeah. Okay? Basically, the health of, a glaciers, uh, of glaciers is, is basically a, a measure of how warm the climate's getting and what's going to happen to sea level. Just in general, before yeah. we leave that, yeah. is this present climate change yeah. period markedly different in terms of the uh, acceleration of the melt or whatever? Well, the glaciers in places like Alaska and in Greenland are probably receding as fast as the glacier did at the end of the last ice age. Now, that mm -hmm. glacier was much bigger. Mm -hmm. And the climate was colder at that time as the glacier was receding, but the glacier was also much further south. So eventually what happens is the climate starts to warm up and the glacier gets out of equilibrium mm -hmm. and it starts to melt very fast. So in my work, I've been able to document in the Connecticut Valley a period of time where the glacier receded at about 250 to 300 meters a year. So some glaciers are receding that fast. They're usually glaciers that are ending in water and icebergs are mm -hmm. breaking off. I see. That helps facilitate the recession or the retreat of the glacier. But the recession rate on land is, is uh, today is, is about the same as it was at the end of the last ice age as the glacier was starting to break up. Okay, so there's nothing exceptional uh, about the present time uh, in terms of the acceleration rate there? No, it's a, it's a rate that was matched back mm -hmm, at the end mm -hmm, of the last mm -hmm, ice age, mm -hmm. certainly. Okay, so, But All what's, right. un, what's unusual about that time period is that the climate system operated differently when there were glaciers on the planet. Um, glaciers uh, change two things in a big way. They, uh, along with the growth of glaciers, we get the reflectance of the glacier surface putting uh, radiation back out into space. So it, it makes it can make the climate even colder than what is making the climate cold to begin with. So positive feedback. Um, and, and the other thing that glaciers do and what happens with a glacial climate is that ocean circulation can change. And ah. that can lead to some extremely abrupt changes in, in climate where over a period of a few years mean annual temperature might drop six or seven degrees centigrade and at the end of that period, it might rise six or seven degrees centigrade very abruptly. 
I see. So, so the climate is, is, during an ice age is much more erratic and prone to much larger fluctuations than we see now. Okay. And that's not to say that global warming right now is, is sh should be disregarded as something that's not important right, or minor. Right. It's, it's something that's unnatural that's happening right now. Yes. It's not a part of the natural climate okay. system. It's, okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted to make yeah. get, get make sure that we got that clear. So I'd like to go now to what you do okay. in terms of geology yeah. that you have a you add another dimension to this. What does a geologist look at? So for and and my work, what I'm trying to do is study the last ice age and piece together what the climate was like during the last ice age. Um, not necessarily determining exactly what the temperature was. I right, know I the temperature was significantly colder than today because the edge of a glacier was here in the way. Yeah, There's yeah. no question about that. But we're trying to figure out what the pattern of climate was from the time the glacier reached its maximum extent and as it melted. So um, one way to look at that would be that the glacier would just start to melt backwards and the climate would slowly warm up and the glacier would recede. And, and we know for a fact that that's not exactly what happened. We uh, know that there were periods of time where the ice would recede rapidly and then it would get cold again and it would readvance, maybe not to the extent that it had reached previously. So I like to say that the glacier had a sort of a nervous and jerky recession across the land surface. <laughs> okay. All right, all yeah. right. It wasn't soothing or anything no, like that. No, <laughs> it just didn't recede. Right. It readvanced and right. it receded right. and it readvanced right. and it receded. And it did that multiple times between about 25 and, and 11,000 years ago. Uh, just incidentally, yeah. there seems to be interest in this. You may know something about it that they had set back the date when humans yeah. arrived in North sure. America. And I thought, oh, I'll just have to ask you about okay. that because uh, people in your business can probably say whether they could have inhabited, and that might be very uneven in different areas yeah. of the North America. So um, in, in that particular situation, what was found was uh, a mammoth bone that had been apparently sculpted with tools. And the mammoth bone is 130,000 years old. So we know the age of the mammoth bone. We don't really know when the bone was sculpted. Yeah, it was sculpted, right. So a, I think it's an interesting find. Yeah. Um, but I think the jury is still out on, uh, right. on, on what that right. actually right. represents. If it does, in fact, represent humans being here at 130,000 years ago, that would be a, a monumental change in the way we think about but things. But you would, that would be the sort of thing that you could sort of verify. That's a, a very interesting point, that you could yeah. have a very ancient bone, but... Yeah. I mean, if you found a mammoth bone, and mammoth bones were very valuable to those early people that could right. use them to make tools, um, it, it would be something that they would use regardless of how old it was. And it'd have to be pretty well preserved, but you know, it, it could be a very old bone sculpted by somebody that, that was here Much 10, more recent, years exactly, yeah. exactly, which would make lots of sense. Yeah. But the other thing is, would you have mammoths that long ago? If it was heavily glaciated. Well, mammoths didn't live on the glacier. They lived just south of it. And there's, okay. there's more species of mammoths than I think the picture that most people have is of woolly mammoths. Yes. Which did roam along the edge of the ice sheet. They lived in an Arctic climate. But there's also Colombian mammoths, for instance, that, that are found in the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. So they lived in a warmer climate I and they see. lived down through Central yeah, America. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, they were more they like predated, modern elephants. Yeah, yeah. You know, they weren't hairy like woolly mammoths. Right, so. right. I see. So they could yeah. have easily been here long before yeah. humans arrived or whatever. Well, thank you for that. But yeah. I, I, <laughs> since there is so much apparently in yeah. reading these varves that you're going to tell us about, yeah. that, that there's, you can really reconstruct a history of the climate and of the earth apparently yeah. from that. Yeah, this is a map of the northeastern United States. And I guess to start with, uh, we ought to explain what a varve is. Okay? Um, a varve is nothing more than an annual sediment layer. Okay. So uh, varves can form in glacial lakes, which is what we're going to be talking about. But they form in a lot of other environments 
any place where sediment is put down differently in the summer versus the winter. Okay. So monsoonal climates would be, a, would be situations where you might have virus where there's a rainy season and a lot of runoff and sediment pours into a lake. And then there's a season where, uh, you know, really fine sediment settles and we have a slightly different layer put down during that time of the year. But that would give us a marker to identify the beginning and ending of the year. Tree rings are a good example yes, of something that, that does that. But they're really quite distinct, quite clear. A barb is nothing more than an annual sediment are. layer. And yeah. this is a map of the northeastern United States. Right. It's, it's showing the major glacial lakes that were in front of the receding ice sheet. So uh -huh. as the ice sheet is receding from the yellow uh, or the orange line down at the bottom, that's yeah. where its maximum extent is. It recedes like a window shade being pulled up across uh -huh. the land surface. Uh -huh. And as it does that, in a few places, there are lakes in valleys, like the Merrimack Valley and the Connecticut yes. Valley and the Hudson Valley. And those lakes expand at the front of the glacier as it recedes. And they probably had icebergs in them and everything. It would have been like uh, places in Alaska. And, um, you know, the ice recedes into northern New England. These lakes expand and get much longer, and they last a long time. So they're receiving sediment not only from rivers on the land surface, but from meltwater streams coming from the glacier. And that sediment that's put into these lakes is mostly put in during the summer. I when see. lots of meltwater is produced yeah. and you get coarse sediment being put down across the floor of the lake. So when I say coarse, I mean uh, sand and silt. But when the winter rolls around, the melting stops and what happens is that all of the really fine particles that are in the lake, the clay particles then settle and they produce a distinct winter layer. And that's what allows us to define VARs or the okay, annual layers. Okay, all in right, the and we'll see that with so yes. So what we do is uh, we go to places where there were glacial lakes and we take cores of the lake sediment that's still uh, okay. on the floor of the valley. Okay. So if you go to the Connecticut Valley today, there was a huge glacial lake there called Glacial Lake Hitchcock but you're not gonna see any lake there. There's the old lake bottom sediment is filling the basin. It goes way down below river level in many so places. So this is what you would see way down if you took yeah. a core yeah. sample. Yeah, and, and there's lots of places on the land surface we can actually see sediment like this in exposures on uh -huh. the sides of the uh -huh. valley. So this is actually a core from um, a South Windsor, Connecticut. Okay. So, um, what we did here is we prepared the core so that you can see the individual winter and summer layers. So we take a core and we split it in half and we shave it with a, a knife or a razor. And then we, slow, we let it slowly dry and the clay beds retain their moisture so they remain dark. Uh -huh. And the silt and sand beds that are deposited in the summer get lighter in color. So it allows you to see that better. Okay, so the light is the summer. Is the summer light. The, and yeah. the dark band is the winter. Yeah, so if you took a little sample of the summer layer, it would feel gritty between uh -huh. your fingers. If you took a little a smidge of the dark band or the clay bed, it would feel like grease. Okay. You know, it's very, very fine sediment. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, this is, in this section of core, there's a scale over on the left, which yeah. is in centimeters. Um, each one of those dark bands is a winter layer, and the okay. light layer between them is a summer layer. I noticed that there is quite a bit of unevenness Absolutely. there. Well, what not does every that year tell is you? Not every year is the same. Yes. So um, you got to remember, too, back at this time, the melt season or the summer may have only been 90 or 120 days long when there were melting conditions. I see. So that can change if one year is cloudier or slightly cooler. Right. There won't be as much melting. There won't be as much sediment put into the lake. So every year is going to be different. And that's basically recording differences in weather, weather patterns from uh, year to year. Okay. But over the long term, what can happen is over centuries, you may go through a warm period where the barbs are generally thicker and then a cool period where they're generally thinner. And we can see that in these records, in these cores. So this is a record of yeah, the climate over a very long period of time. It can be. So we have a varv, uh, we, we have a, an assembly of varves in the Connecticut Valley that's over 5,600 years long. Ah. So for 5,600 years, we can sort of track what the climate was doing, whether right. it was warm and cool. How many years is that roughly? Then? Right there? Well, there's numbers on the sides. So we actually number each varve. 
All right. Okay. So, and for reasons that, are, that are, are still a mystery to me, the per person who first started doing this back in the 1920s, Ernst Antes, started numbering at 3,000. Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why he That's started okay. that. But, but And he found okay. 300 older varves, so it, the oh. numbering actually starts at 2,700. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. So right here we go from 3,370 up to 3,381. So there's, there's 11 years okay. on that slide. All right. But you, I mean, getting the core, yeah. you would have a very long core, presumably. Yeah, now, now, you don't find the... Uh, entire record at one place. Uh -huh. So what happens uh -huh. is in the southern end of the basin, as the glacier recedes, you start, barbs bar start piling up, but they can fill the lake. But by that time, the glacier is way up valley and there's still a lake there, and okay. so barbs of that uh -huh. age are yes, piling. Yes. So what we have to do is we have to correlate the cores that we take from different parts of the valley and put together a long record. Does it tell you anything else from a geological standpoint, like the mineral makeup or anything? Do you see diff anything of interest Well, the mineral there? makeup of the virus will give them different colors. So when we ah. are down in southern Connecticut and we're um, investigating virus, they're red because there's red sedimentary rocks that got ground up by the glacier, and that's the color of the sediment that ended up in the lake. It, it would have been a pretty strange thing if you were there during the last ice age. There'd be the glacier in the lake, and the water in the lake would look red oh, because, for goodness sake. because of all the red shale that was ground up by the ice and pumped into the lake. But as that glacier recedes up into New Hampshire and Vermont, there is no red shale and all the sediment is gray. So the lake would look gray. So the there's a very distinct oh, regional very, character as yeah, well yeah. to it. Is yeah. there anything else that you glean so, from these barbs? Well, so the Traditionally, VAR records have been used as time scales because you have an unbelievable resolution of time. So this is from the last ice age. Those pictures that you saw there are from barbs that are about 17,000 years They're old. Very clear. Yeah. So that's 17,000 years ago, and you can see individual years. That's, yeah, that's, a huge, yeah, that's an yeah. unbelievable resolution. Right, right. But some VARs, when they're thicker, you can see events during the summer. So you can see rainstorm events or big oh, flood events. Oh, for goodness sake! And yeah. so you can you can match that event, you know, in one one core, for instance, in the Connecticut Valley, with cores taken in the Merrimack Valley. Ah, uh, and we can go to get across. a big, larger regional. Yeah, and it's amazing. It's very amazing to me that the weather was so uniform across New England because it's not like that today. No, <laughs> no, not it's on any given thing. day, no. even right between <laughs> yesterday and today, like not at all. To. No. <laughs> It's good to know that long yeah. before humans were here, it was it was stable. The climate yeah. was stable. Yeah. I don't know what that tells us. Okay, <laughs> but in so the, uh, the what I especially wanted to get out of this was the yeah. barbs and and what they tell you because I know that they that. Uh, uh, people in this business of studying the glacial history look at all kinds of sure. information that these things leave us from the distance past, very accurate ones. Yeah, so there's, there's four things that we can do with the VARBs. The first is that we can set up a time scale and we can, we can measure how fast the glacier was receding. Uh, so when I said before uh, the glacier was receding at 300 meters a year, I know that because of the annual layer counts that we do from the right. southern end of the valley it's to the northern. It's that accurate. Yeah, very accurate. And so that's one thing that we can do. So the patterns of thickness change that we see in the virus also tell us something about what's happening to the climate. We can see abrupt cold events where the virus are relatively thick and then they get very thin all of a sudden. Um, we can see when uh, uh, drainage events occurred. So if there's a small lake in a tributary valley and it's released, and it flows into the main valley, it produces a flood event, and we can see those. So, so two other things uh, besides the glacial geology, in the lake sediment we find plant fossils. Ah, uh, yes. So the plant fossils that we find, for instance, uh, all the way from Connecticut up to northern New Hampshire and Vermont are from tundra plants that don't live here anymore. And we can tell exactly what the vegetation was like on the land surface from that. The other thing that we found, and a, and a colleague of mine at Tufts, Jacob Benner, is an expert in this, is we find evidence of uh, vertebrates and also invertebrates that were living on the floor of the lake. So when they live on the floor of the lake, they crawl across the sediment surface. Yeah. And if we're at an outcrop or an exposure, we can peel apart the beds and see their tracks and trails. 
So you can see the tracks and trails of all kinds of things like uh, nematode worms and insect larvae and small crustaceans. But the big find that, that we had about 15 years ago was we found the trails left behind by fish swimming across the floor of the lake. From that time? From that time period. So you can tell when fish first arrived in the, in the Connecticut Valley, anyway. So um, at least two different species, probably an Arctic char and sculpins were alive in the within lake years, huh? within 50 years of the glacier receding. Isn't and that amazing? Yeah, I don't know how they put like up with how all they, the Exactly, silk. right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that is a substantial record. What I like about that is it seems like it's extremely accurate. That yeah. you can yeah. uh, now with modern equipment and so on yeah. uh, and, and to ways of analysis, you can get so, a very accurate so, uh, picture. So it's, it's very precise in terms of you know what year you're in but yeah. you still have to solve the problem of when was that year so what we do to we have this big string of barbs but we don't know uh, just by looking at the barbs whether it's 15,000 years old or 20 yes, I years. see so when we find plant leaves what we can do is have those leaves radiocarbon dated, ah. and that's how we get the absolute or the numerical age okay. for the thing independent of the numbering system right if you were only looking at the soil you might yeah. i mean if the if what you were able to see right. was only soil you couldn't be sure of that i would know it you was from the ice age it some way i understand because that, they would right? have arctic plants and layers fossils. and so yeah. on right yeah and we know there's a glacial lake there right um but i wouldn't know what year it right. was i would know if if one var was 10 years older than another right. bar, very precisely. Right, you know. exactly. But the biological data yeah. really give you a year, and then you can Absolutely. pin that. That's very interesting. Yeah. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Well, you probably spend a great deal of time in the field. And in the mud. In the mud. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to make it a nicer way there, but uh, in the mud, right, yeah. and uh, learn to enjoy it. But this is a, a, an area that is really adding a lot of information at this time. Um, is it a good field for young people to be getting into at this time? Well, I think uh, in general, glacial geology is a pretty important thing because uh, the soils that we have on the land surface are primarily glacial sediment. Um, our groundwater resources in many places come from glacial deposits, and especially in valleys that are filled with sand and gravel left behind by, you know, deposits put into glacial lakes or by the rivers that were in front of the glacier. And so those are, are very important resources. Um, something like 60, 65 percent of all valleys in New England had glacial lakes in them, and those lakes were pretty shallow for the most part. So when the glaciers pumping all the sediment in, they fill up with sand and gravel, this permeable material that is now, you know, basically filling uh, valleys across New England. And there's lots and lots of water wells that are in those deposits, ah. and it represents an extremely important groundwater resource. So understanding how they're deposited right. and what their geometry is in the subsurface. Yeah is very important to understanding that resource. Right. Yeah. So this is really a critical part of earth science in yeah, general sure. at this time, and a good time to be in this field, I'd imagine. Yeah, I think so. Right. Uh, I guess that you will be going out into the field here soon. Is that the case yeah. in the summer? Do you? I have a few projects. Yes. <laughs> um, actually, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll probably end up out in uh, New York State for a week and then in the Connecticut Valley for a few weeks and then um, right here in the Middlesex Fells for not studying barbs but studying right. rocks. Right. So we talked about how fast glaciers were receding in places like Alaska. Um, these are images from the National Snow and Ice Data Center and I recommend that you get on their website because they have um, historical pictures of glaciers, sometimes pictures taken from exactly the same point, ah. so that you can see what it looked like back in the early 1900s, yeah. 1940s, you know, this up to the present. This is incredible. So this is uh, the Peterson Glacier. It's spelled P-E-D-E-R, not P-E-T. Okay, and where is it? It's in Alaska. So there's a picture from 1917. You can see the margin of the glacier, and there was a glacial lake in front of that glacier. At the top there, right? At the yeah. top, and, and at the bottom is a picture in 2015. There's this meadow, which is the old floor of the lake, and way off in the distance is the margin of the Peterson Glacier today, and it's receded, you know, a, a kilometer and a half away. Yeah. So.
it's, uh, it's receding pretty rapidly. Yes, and we see this everywhere, yeah. uh, apparently. Yeah. So it is, uh, I, I'm just still probably not clear about whether it represents something different in terms of the accelerating uh, well, decline. It, the, the than acceleration in the past. of the melting of these glaciers really started uh, back around 1980 to 1990. Okay, yeah. And they were receding but they were taking their time right and, and then they really started to recede quite rapidly yes and um this is especially true in alaska so um it, it's also true in greenland so. yes and a good bit of alarm but now even yeah. they're watching antarctica with some anxiety yeah as so well. the antarctica yeah. is a little different because it's a polar glacier it's in oh. an extremely cold climate yes and um, it, it doesn't have quite the same response to climate change. The one place in Antarctica that is responding uh, a little bit like the other glaciers which are in warmer climates is the, on the Antarctic Peninsula. The peninsula is right across from South America. And there we're seeing you know, ice shelves breaking up yeah, on the peninsula right, and everything. But right. luckily the, the smaller ice shelves, not the bigger ones. Yes. Right, yeah. but you stay on land here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was very good information. Dr. Ridge, thank you so much for You're sharing welcome. all of this, and uh, we wish you luck in the mud yeah, this the mud. summer <laughs> coming up soon here. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome.